Thank you. So as uh, Reiner said, I'm going to talk about uh, creating data structures in Rust. Uh, these are lessons I learned creating a data structure called Range Set Blaze, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, you can find the project and some of my other projects on GitHub, Carl K, Carl K, and there's a longer write-up of this and some related articles on Medium, all for free, medium.com, at Carl M. Katie. So just to review, uh, what is a data structure? Why do we care about this? So a data structure is code that stores and organizes data in, a, a, in memory for efficient use later. Um, if you use Rust, there's some data structures you're going to be very familiar with. An array is a data structure. So here we construct a data structure from one, two, three, four, five. And along with constructing an array, we also have things like accessing the elements of array. Here we ask for uh, the element and in index position two, and we verify that it's what we expect, uh, three. Another popular data structure in Rust is a vector. Uh, in this example, we create a new vector. We push the value one into the vector. We push the value two into the vector. So push is a, a method on the vector that modifies it. Um, it has properties or methods we can ask about so we can ask what's the vector's length now uh, and we verify that the length of the vector is now two uh, another data structure that's uh, also available in the standard library um, that's uh, i think interesting is hash map so in the example we'll create a new hash map and then we'll insert a key and a value the key is the string topic and the value is the string rust. So we have an insert method. Um, we can also do a search here. We can say, does the map currently contain the key building? And the answer will be no. So we've got a not sign uh, symbol there because right now the only uh, key in the map is topic. So in general, we've got this memory that organizes uh, data for us and we often include operators like insertion, deletion. We'll often do a traversal. We'll want to see all the elements in a data structure, if that makes sense for our data structure. Uh, sometimes we'll want to search for things if that's appropriate for our data structure. When you're coding yourself and you think about whether you want to create a data structure, um, one reason you might want to is it's a nice way to organize your code. It's a kind of sensible way that you can understand somebody of your code if it does have a kind of a coherent story about accessing uh, data in a particular way. I also find creating, uh, refactoring my code to pull out a data structure so it's its own thing, um, good for optimizing because once I've done that, once you do that, you can focus uh, on that data structure and think about ways to make it faster or more uh, memory efficient, whatever is more appropriate for you. It's especially important if you've created some code and you think some way that you're manipulating the data would be interesting to others if you want to share it. Uh, instead of giving people a whole bunch of your code and then saying, oh, here, find this and this and do this and this, like uh, just functions, uh, if you create a data structure, you can say, here's a thing that people can then try to understand. Um, and it makes it easier to share because it makes it more comprehensible. Um, I created the range set blaze data structure, not for any of those reasons. I did it because I thought it was kind of, a, uh, range sets were kind of an interesting data structure. And I wanted to see how it was uh, to implement it in, in Rust. I'd already done a previous version in Python. So I did it for fun. Maybe not always the best reason, but a good enough reason uh, for me this time. Um, let's talk a little bit about the range set blaze data structure. Um, a range set itself is a sometimes useful but obscure data structure. The point of a range set is to represent a mathematical set. So in that way, it's like uh, the standard Rust data structures like hash set or B tree set, some set of elements. Um, the difference with a range set is that 
um, it's restricted in the kind of things it can represent, and that internally it stores those things as a sorted disjoint list of ranges. So, for example, um, this could be information inside a range set. So we say we have the integers 100 to about 2,000, uh, 20,000 something to about 30 million, and uh, 105 million 13 to 100 and uh, sorry, 101 million um, 16. So we've got three ranges. You can see I'm doing the uh, uh, inclusive version of, of Rust ranges. These few characters, less than 100, um, now represent more than 30 million individual integers. And you can see if your data fits into something like this, you can potentially save a huge amount of memory. Uh, and you can imagine that function uh, and operations you might want to do, like set union and set intersection, are much more efficient in this rep in some form of this representation than they would be over the um, over 30 million individual integers. Uh, here's an example of using uh, the range set blaze data structure in particular. We'll construct a new range set called A from, um, uh, from an array of uh, ranges. We'll construct another one called B from an array of ranges. And then we'll do a set uh, union on the two of them. And uh, here's a graphical representation of that, A and B, and we union them together and we get C, and we can verify that C is indeed equal um, to minus 20, two minus 20 and 100 to uh, 999 inclusive. So uh, while I was creating the range set data structure, I kept in mind what I was learning about creating data structures and kind of formulate that into what could nicely be called nine suggestions, but I wanted to be a little, sound a little bossier. So I'm gonna call them nine rules. Uh, we'll go over all of them, some of them pretty quickly. And the rules will cover things like the importance of plagiarizing, designing your constructors, um, the iterators you'll need to create, what to do with illegal values and how to guarantee properties, um, some thoughts on defining operators, um, the importance of some just general things like good documentation, special importance, I should say, um, how to think about performance and some of the issues having to do with testing. So let's uh, now look at the rules one at a time. So the first rule is that you should plagiarize as much of your program interface your documentation and even your code as you possibly can. Uh, in particular, the standard library is a good place to plagiarize things for. So if your data structure is similar to something that's already in the um, standard library, in my case, I'm representing sets of integers, B tree set and standard library is also good at representing uh, uh, sorted sets. So, I should plagiarize as much of B tree set as I can. And the first step to doing that is to look at the documents for the standard uh, B tree set. When I look at it, I see that it defines 28 methods. So we can clear a B tree set. We can take two B tree sets and see if one is a superset of another. Uh, also, and this surprised me, B tree set, the standard B tree set implements 18 rushed traits. I would have guessed, I don't know, two or three, but 18. And they're things like uh, uh, from iter. And we'll uh, look at that a bit later, some more. Uh, given that it does support all these traits, I was surprised that it doesn't support um, a trait called set, mathematical set. There, Rust doesn't have any trait. Uh, interface that represents a set. Instead, all of its set-like uh, data structures kind of implement a hodgepodge of things, and they may or may not be exactly compatible uh, with each other. So when we look at the B tree set documentation, let's look at uh, uh, is superset. We can see that we get 
nice function signature, a nice description, and some examples that uh, actually can be run. And most importantly, we there's a, a source button here in uh, almost all Rust documentation. When we click the source button, we'll get we'll see this code down here, which is the actual implementation of the library version of B-Tree Set. So what I did with Range Set Blaze, look at Range Set Blaze documentation. I copied most of the function signature. I literally copied the um, documentation string here, and I even um, translated the example from the B-Tree example to a Rust Set Blaze example. And it's exactly the uh, otherwise exactly the same example. Um, at the code, um, not only like yeah. So by uh, plagiarizing things from the standard library, you'll get a familiar starting design. So that's good for both you and for uh, any users you have. You'll get free documentation and documentation tests. And in fact, you might even get free code. When I went and looked at the code for B-Tree Set for is superset uh, between two things, uh, uh, self and other, I found out that all it does is apply is subset to other and self. And so in my implementation of is superset, I just did exactly the same thing. Um, another thing I got from plagiarizing here was um, looking at these attributes. The pound stable attribute turned out not to be relevant when you're creating your own library, but I wasn't really familiar with pound must use. Um, I looked it up, kind of found out what it was about, and decided it was also appropriate uh, for range set plays. One caveat is you don't want to plagiarize everything. Presumably, there's some reason that your data structure is different than the standard data structure, or you wouldn't be doing it. So, for example, uh, B tree set has a method called first that uh, if the set is empty returns none and if it's not empty returns the sorted first um, element of the set of elements except it returns it a, a reference to that first element because uh, range set plays only holds integers I made my version of first to return the actual value and not just a reference to a value, because that seemed more uh, performant uh, and appropriate for integers. OK, let's go over to uh, rule two. You want to design constructors excuse me, for uh, ease of use, compatibility, and speed. Um, you'll almost always want to construct a new and a default constructor. In my case, and in most set-related data structures, they would create an empty. Uh, they'd represent the empty set. Uh, I want to talk about uh, some of the other constructors. Um, if you construct a constructor from iter, here I'm constructing from uh, uh, an array of integers, then you not only get from iter, but you also for free can get uh, collect, which can be useful for uh, both you and your uh, users. So if we construct a range set plays from this array with from iter, from this array with collect, uh, we can verify that the two range set plays, things that we've created are equal, and we can even print out uh, what they look like, and range set plays can take things out of order and put the, uh, it sorts them and makes them disjoint, gets rid of overlap, so uh, uh, it produces that. Um, generally, it's good to be permissive in what you accept in input. So here we've got redundant. Uh, the second example, we have redundant inputs. Um, they're overlapping. They're not sorted. Um, that's fine. Range set plays will take care of all the work to do that and put them in the canonical uh, order that uh, it represents them with internally. Uh, just like from iter gets you collect for free, if you implement from, you get into for free. So here, kind of matching what uh, B-Tree set does, I accept uh, from directly from an array or an array into, and you can get a range set plays, and we get the same values as we did up here with uh, from iter. Whoops. Um, generally, you should be permissive in what you accept, but there might be efficiencies. 
if the user could promise me that the input that they're getting is already um, non-overlapping, that is disjoint and sorted, then I wouldn't have to do the work. Uh, the data structure wouldn't have to do the work to make them disjoint and sorted. So uh, Range Set Blaze actually has a method called from sorted disjoint um, that takes an iterator where the things are already sorted and disjoint, an iterator of ranges, um, and uh, get some efficiencies from that. But that's kind of a special case. Um, and the user has to go through some extra work to guarantee um, that the iterator that's getting input uh, really is uh, uh, has the guaranteed properties. We'll talk about that a little bit more uh, on a later rule. OK, uh, rule three is just to be prepared to create more Rust iterators than you expect. So recall that a, uh, in Rust and iterators, the thing that lets us do a for in. So example, here, uh, we create a range set blaze from this, and then we do for value in the, the range set blaze iter, and we'll get uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, 15. Um, in general, an iterator, when you create one, you create a new struct that implements an, a next method. And the next method, um, if there is no next thing available because you've run to the end of the iterator, it returns none. If there is a next value, it returns that value uh, wrapped in a sum. So um, think to yourself, how many iterators do you think the standard B tree set um, defines? Again, my guess would have been something like three. But in fact, the standard B tree set implements eight iterators, iter and into iter, okay, two, but it also has drain filter, something called range, um, and then th uh, three set related ones, difference, symmet symmetric difference, intersection, um, and union. Following the same kind of philosophy, uh, range set blaze also has a bunch of iterators, uh, even more. It turned out I ended up implementing 13 iterators, which was a lot in part because Rust, unlike languages like previously used, use, say, Python or C Sharp, doesn't have a yield and it doesn't uh, make any guarantees about optimizing tail recursion, which means that when we implement a next method, we're doing a lot of looping or maybe some functional programming inside a loop. Um, it tends to be low level uh, code. I find it kind of fun to write these uh, iterators, but they're not particularly easy um, on, because of their kind of low levelness. Um, they are efficient, so, so that, part's, uh, that part's good. Um, and, just to reiterate then, the, the lesson from rule three is just kind of prepare yourself mentally for um, writing some of these iterator uh, functions. We're mostly gonna skip uh, rules four and five. You can get more details uh, from the article, um, but just in general, you wanna make illegal values unrepresentable. So for example, range set blaze only handles uh, the integer types doesn't handle the character type. If a user tries to create a range set blaze of characters, um, the, uh, there'll be a nice compiler error saying this isn't a type um, that is supported. And that's done via, uh, a, 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 it implements its own trait called integer and it checks that everything that gets, uh, that you try to put into it uh, is, is part of that trait. Um, also, um, if appropriate, you want to guarantee uh, properties. So I mentioned that we might want to have an iterator that we can input from that guarantees that things are already sorted and disjoint. Um, there's a way, again, uh, using traits in Rust to do that so that nobody can sneak in uh, an iterator that doesn't have that property. Um, kind of accidentally and the compiler will check if someone puts a, tries to, 
if someone tries to use the constructor that assumes the iterator is sorted in disjoint, um, if someone tries to put a different iterator in, it won't be allowed in because it won't have the right uh, trait properties. Uh, rule six, I, I, in some ways, I found some of the most fun. Um, once you have a data structure, you can think about what operations and operators are appropriate for it. And then you can do anything you want. So given your data structure, you can ask yourself, does it make sense to define a plus operation between two instances of your data structure? Um, does it make sense to define uh, less than for it or shift? But you don't have to use any of these symbols. You can use these symbols to be anything uh, you want. And in fact, there's 31 possible uh, operators that Rust lets you define on your own um, data structure. And if any of them seem appropriate for your data structure, uh, you can define them. Um, the way you define them is, like most things in Rust, you define a trait uh, and then a method inside that uh, trait. So for example, I wanted vertical bar to be uh, set union. Um, this symbol. Um, the way I do that is by implementing a trait called bit or. And why it's called bit or and not vertical bar is because, I don't know, the, the most, it's vertical bar is usually used in Rust for bit or. Um, but in this case, I'm going to use it for um, set union. And I just implement the bit or method and then I'll get uh, set union. You might wonder why I use vertical bar instead of uh, uh, plus sign for set union, different languages, different data structure uh, designers might have made a different choice there. Um, I didn't have to make that choice. Following back to rule one, plagiarizing, I did what uh, BC tra B um, B tree set and hash set did. They used a vertical bar for set union, so I used a vertical bar for set union, and I didn't think whether or not there was a better symbol for it because I it was more important to be consistent. Um, one thing you'll find out as soon as you implement something like vertical bar to be set union and then try to use it, you'll find out it doesn't work everywhere you want because you don't really just want set union between two owned um, uh, instances. You also want set union between two references, between a reference and an owned and between an owned and a reference. So because of that, instead of implementing each of these once, you'll actually be implementing, you actually want to implement them four times. Um, there is a nice crate gen ops that can help uh, streamline that. So you really do only have to implement it once uh, uh, if, you want to, if you want to use it. Rule six is kind of a, I'm sorry, rule seven is kind of a meta rule and that's follow a different set of nine rules, the nine rules of good application program interface design. Um, that's another article. Six rules from that article especially apply. And the most important one is to write good documentation. And not just to help your users so they understand your data structure, but to keep your design honest. There's nothing more important than writing documentation and then trying, getting to the point where you're telling a user, oh, be sure you do this before that or it won't work. Watch out for this. And then deciding, you're, man, this is so embarrassing. This is so hard to explain. You know what? I'm just going to fix the data structure to simplify it so it will be easier to explain. Likewise, so you should have documentation on every public uh, thing that you create in your data structure. And you should have an example on almost every um, uh, bit of documentation um, that you write. And if you find yourself going, man, I can't write an, an example here because all the examples would be too long to even get started, then that's another sign that you need to fix your design so that simple things are simple. Uh, and again, keep keeping you honest. Some other tips uh, of good application program interface design is to always use Clippy to uh, try to accept as many types uh, as you can. If you're accepting a, uh, a path, also accept uh, uh, the, the path buff. 
and a string and a stir. Um, where appropriate, uh, make sure you um, define and return nice errors. Interestingly, a lot of data structures don't return any errors. Um, uh, the standard uh, uh, B tree set um, doesn't have any error type because if you give it some, it accepts most things. And if you give it something it really can't accept, it just panics. Um, and another good rule from that article was know your users' needs, ideally by eating your own dog food. That means you really shouldn't create a data structure that you don't need and have and don't try using yourself. Um, I'll confess that I, because I was doing this one for fun, um, I didn't follow that rule, but it's still a good rule. Uh, rule eight is optimizing your performance using representative data, criterion benchmarking, and profiling. So ideally, you have some real-world data that you can put through your data structure and tell whether or not um, users are going to be happy uh, using your data structure with its uh, performance. In this case, I didn't have that. So I did the next best thing, which was to create synthetic data. One synthetic bit of data was just generating, say, over a range of a million uh, integers uniformly. And as you can imagine, uh, some number of, of integers, as you can imagine, the um, standard uh, libraries, uh, set data structures, hash set in particular, is quite good at uh, taking a bunch of integers that are just uniform. And in fact, range set plays is uh, pretty bad uh, when the integers that it's given to manipulate are um, uh, are distributed uniformly over a wide uh, over a wide range. So it's about two and a half times worse than the standard uh, library under data that's generated that way. So you might think that's discouraging, but no, <laughs> because the other way that I thought was interesting for generating data was generating data where uh, instead of generating individual integers, I generate uh, ranges of integers randomly over a big range, and then um, give them to the data to the data structures constructor uh, one integer at a time. So we'll call those clumpy um, integers. And in that case, range set plays is ten to thirty times um, faster than the standard library on manipulating those integers. And if we're willing to give it the integers. Um, as ranges instead of as individual um, integers, it's uh, hundreds of times faster. So with these two kinds of data, uh, I was both able to give users kind of an honest assessment of a worst case performance and uh, make sure it was running fast for the uh, conditions that it was really designed for, which is well, uh, what I'm calling the clumpy integers. Um, to measure the performance of things, you'll want to use the Criterion uh, crate. Criterion is the most popular benchmarking crate in Rust. Uh, I found it nice. I actually think it's uh, it was smarter than I was. I had these big, long benchmarks that took a long time to run, and Criteria would tell me that it really wanted shorter benchmarks. And I thought, oh, I want a long one. And I decided Criterion was right. So my general advice is don't fight Criterion if you give it the kind of quick runs that it expects. It can generate all kinds of uh, meaningful and important statistics for you uh, pretty much automatically. Um, you can use the benchmarking to drive uh, algorithm design. Range set blaze isn't the only range set crate available for Rust. Um, there's several. I benchmarked them all. Did I, uh, maybe not all. I benchmarked all the, uh, many of the candidates. Um, some of them represent this list of sorted and disjoint ranges in a vector, and some of them represent it in some kind of tree. It turned out that the fastest one that used a vector was 14 times slower than the slowest one that used a tree. So that helped me know that I wanted to use a tree to represent the, uh, the list of ranges, and that allowed range set plays to be 50 times faster um, than the fastest uh, vector-based uh, data structure, thanks to benchmarking. I knew to make that design. Um, profiling is another thing you can do. You can try to find the function or functions that are taking 
uh, the most of your um, time in your um, data structure and doing its operations. Uh, FlameGraph is the most popular tool in Rust for uh, doing uh, profiling. I find FlameGraph a little bit limited. I was used to C++ style profilers like the uh, License Visual Studio, AMD has one. Um, and I actually found out that since these profilers just work on uh, executable code, they don't care whether the code was created by C++ or Rust. So I used, uh, I used Visual Studio uh, to do profiling, although in this case, I didn't really find anything particularly interesting. But uh, FlameGraph is easy to use and uh, free, so that might be a good place to start. Uh, and a final rule, let's talk about testing. Um, you want to test coverage. You want to test all the examples in your documentation. You want to test that you've implemented expected traits. You want to test that if you're giving compiler errors, like if a user puts in the wrong type for your data structure, that you're giving a sensible, that they'll get a sensible compiler error. And to the degree you can, you want to check that your data structure does the right thing, that it's correct, because your users will um, be depending on it. Um, here are just a, a few tips along those lines. Uh, one is I used LLVM Cove to measure coverage, but I also tried. Uh, coverage is making sure that every line of your um, code is actually executed some somewhere by a test. You often find yourself creating new tests. I decided to also put those new tests uh, in my integration test um, folder. Integration tests are tests that only use your public uh, methods and objects. And so by adding additional coverage tests, as integration tests, that also gave me another chance to um, exercise the public uh, uh, methods of my uh, data structure. Um, yeah, uh, doc test by example, uh, you should always test your examples in your documentation or they'll be wrong almost instantly. Um, one way you can check correctness, um, a kind of an interesting way is with a, a Rust tool called Quick Check. If you know that some of the operations of your data structure should give the same answers as the operations on a standard data structure, for example, if we're representing sets of integers and we want to know if two sets are disjoint, then B tree set and range set blaze should agree on when they're disjoint and when they're not disjoint. And quicks um, check is a very clever um, uh, testing mechanism that puts in cleverly random um, uh, examples and will feed them to both uh, uh, data structures and uh, give you an error if it finds any uh, inputs that give uh, divergent outputs. Uh, I'm not going to show it, but it's in the uh, article. Uh, I also encourage you to test across many or all the types that you support. Um, yeah, I talked about testing for many traits, missing traits like you forgot to put clone in, uh, there's a way you can uh, look for that um, and testing for legal values. But I'll leave that uh, to the article. So in conclusion, if you want to create a data structure, Rust is a great language um, for creating fast and almost uh, likely correct data structures. Um, if you do decide to do it, I encourage you to uh, follow the nine rules. Um, as a Follow up, you can see the article that this talk's based on on uh, Medium at Carl M. Katie. Um, there's also some other follow up articles porting the data structure to the uh, to the web and to embedded uh, processors, formally proving some of the uh, arithmetic uh, operations that the data structure uses um, using uh, Kana. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, and even formally uh, proving one algorithm correctness using a different tool called Daphne. And finally, uh, published just last week, um, an article about accelerating um, some of the operations in uh, ingesting a bunch of integers uh, with uh, uh, SIMD uh, operations. And with that, I am done. <laughs>